Language Enthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about adjectives. But first, we now have masks to match your scarves, mugs, and notebooks in Lingthusiasm, IPA, Syntax, and Esoteric Symbol Designs. So if you want a bit more Lingthusiasm as you go about your everyday life, that is a thing you can do. They're available in many colours, and you can go to lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I'm interested to see whether people prefer to colour coordinate their face masks with their scarves, or if contrasting colours is the way to go. Stay tuned, we will report back on the Lingthusiasm fashion statement. <laughs> <laughs> Also, this month's Patreon bonus episode is about doing linguistics communication on a shoestring. Uh, bonus 42, which means there are 41 additional bonus episodes if you've run out of Lingthusiasm to listen to. There's way more where that came from at patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm. And it's got a bit of bonus Lingthusiasm origin story because, spoiler, we started our Lingcom projects on a shoestring as well. Absolutely. The Lingcom on a shoestring episode came together because we've been talking to our wonderful linguistics communication project Lincom grantees, and we realised that it's the kind of information that's useful whatever project you're starting, or if you want to know how we got started doing linguistics communication. It can probably be cross-applied for communicating about other types of topics as well, but hey, we're linguists, so we'll call it Lincom. Talk about what we know. <laughs> I have a game for you. I love games. I'm going to give you a word, and then you say whatever word you think of quickly after that. Okay. Let's start with red. Blue. Big. Small. Fast. Slow. Loud. Quiet. Online. Uh, offline? A float. A sink? <laughs> <laughs> no, what is the opposite of a... I don't know what the opposite of a float is. On shore? On board? Okay, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> I didn't think that went through very deeply. Oh, I've been doing so many of these in children's picture books at the moment. It's always a great delight. So these words are, or at least mostly, with the exception of a sink, perhaps, these words are mostly adjectives, which is the kind of word that you might have learned uh, if you played Mad Libs as a hobby, like I did growing up, uh, is a word that describes things. I feel like that's a good start for what an adjective is, in terms of, like, you just need a pithy definition. But I feel like these words all have more things in common than just that. Well, the thing that I find really interesting about adjectives as a category is that they're one of those categories that, like, you know, seems like it kind of gets passed down to us from the descriptive grammatical tradition. But when you start looking at it more closely, it breaks apart really quickly. And there are more differences and more similarities in other types of categories. It really starts to make you question the notion of parts of speech. So when linguists talk about diagnostics for adjectives, in English, sometimes we diagnose adjectives by saying, okay, you can add endings like er or est on them or use words like more and most with them to make comparatives and superlatives. So you can have something be redder or bluest or bigger or smallest, louder or quieter. It doesn't always work, though. <laughs> more online, most online. <laughs> okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, more, more afloat, less afloat, a floater. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, adjectives are, are words that, that they have this sort of descriptive property, but they also have this morphosyntactic property that they can be compared to degrees like other adjectives. And once you start realizing this is something that adjectives do consistently in English, but other word classes don't, these ER and EST suffixes can be used to figure out what isn't an adjective as well. Yeah, if we have a word like dog, and I don't think there is, you know, this dog is dogger than this other dog. This is the doggest dog. Definitely not in standard English. I think it's a great example of how we can be playful, but I don't think it would come up as a, a very standard form. Or we wouldn't have like you are more danciest. <laughs> the dancest? You are the, the most dance doesn't work because I mean you can be a dancer, but that's not that's that doesn't make you more dance than the other person if you're a dancer. <laughs> that's a different kind of er. <laughs> you're a dancer, but I'm the dancest. 
<laughs> that sounds like an invitation to a dance-off. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, you can do these, but they very clearly have this sort of playful quality that, like, fast, faster is just like, yep, you can do that. Whereas, you know, dancer or dancist has this sort of playful quality that, like, you can do it if you want to have a bit of fun, but it's not something that's already part of the sort of canon of, of things that people typically say in English. And this is why we refer to them as diagnostics in the way that we take a temperature on a person to see if they have a fever, we can use these morphemes to test whether a word is an adjective in English or not. Or to have a kind of the weird fun of making something into a different lexical category than it had previously belonged to. You know, so if I want to say, oh, this thing is funner, like, hey, that's that's a bit of fun you can have with lexical conversions. <laughs> Are lexical conversions the funnest thing you can do? I think so. <laughs> They are the funnest. Uh, and, you know, and there are other ways of, of doing this. So that's a test you can do with putting endings on the word. And you can also do tests by what kinds of sentences you can put it in. So if you have something like the red car or the big car, then if you want to test, oh, does dance work in there? The dance car, I kind of. But again, it sounds like <laughs> maybe you're having a bit of fun with the language or the the, the dog car. It's it's an interesting example because if you take a word like like the dog house, right? Mm -hmm. So dog is clearly describing house there. And I think that's one of the issues that confuses people when you're talking about adjectives because you can use other kinds of words to describe something or to modify something like dog house or, you know, dance. I feel like a dance car, I don't know, there's like a party bus. <laughs> the dance car is the budget <laughs> version for when you only have a couple of friends. <laughs> uh, maybe it's a car that, that can dance itself. And, and you can have, be a partier, but you don't have a partyist. Like, this is the partyist bus. This is the dancist car. It can let us sort of do these sorts of diagnostics language internally and figure out, here's what's sort of going on in English. Here's what's going on with this particular word, where if we want to try to force it into the mold of being really adjective-y, then we can do it, but it's very clearly playful. Whereas if we make this one into a very adjective-y sort of mold, it's like, yep, okay, lots of people are already doing that. We've been using the er uh, comparative and the est superlative uh, suffixes to tell if something is an adjective, but we can also use like an, a negative diagnostic to check if something is definitely not one of the other word categories. Right. So if you have a word like party or cake, which we know is a noun, one of the things that nouns can do is nouns can become plural. So you have cakes, you have parties. This sounds like a great afternoon. Um, I'm having, I'm having the party cake. <laughs> but you can't have bigs. You can't use the plural on an adjective. Right. Bigs and, and smalls and reds. And if you do, it's kind of because you're actually treating this adjective as a noun. And sometimes that means, so if I'm doing laundry, I can be like, oh, I'm going to put the reds in this pile and the blues in that pile. And now I've taken these words that are traditionally adjectives and I've, you know, converted them into nouns, which is something that, that people do pretty regularly. Um, this isn't as playful because like people have already done it. And oh, now I'm actually using this adjective as a noun. Like, English is a language that's very prone to bringing words into crossing over into other lexical categories. Many other languages also do this. And it's something that we kind of miss when we talk about, oh, red, it's an adjective, because you can sometimes use it as a noun. And, you know, if you talk about, like, we're going to wash all the reds together, you're using it as a noun there. It's not that red's always an adjective. It's just kind of most canonical form is an adjective in the same way that you can make, um, <laughs> this is the partiest bus I've ever seen. Uh, you know, if you want to make that into an adjective, you kind of can. I used to get very anxious about this because I liked just being like, these words are adjectives and these words are nouns. But once I got comfortable with the diagnostic approach of just looking what a word is doing in the particular context it's being said, it's actually a lot more liberating and relaxing to be like, I will just accept this word on the terms that it arrives at me, and I can look at where it is in the word order, because that's important for English. And I can also look at what suffixes it has, because that's also useful for English. So I can use these criteria every time, and I don't have to remember a list of what's an adjective and what's a noun and what's a verb. I can just use these criteria that I know when I come across an example. Yeah, and I think it's one of the things that distinguishes a linguistic approach to grammar from a sort of like, uh, I'm taking this high school English class approach to grammar. Because I definitely remember being taught, okay, you know, like, if you want to know if something's an adjective, you can like look it up in the dictionary and the dictionary will tell you. But this, of course, raises the very obvious question of, 
Well, how did the dictionary makers know that this was an adjective? <laughs> Um, and who decided that? And also, like, dictionaries are great. I'm not, I'm not anti-dictionary. But if you're always looking for external authorities for something that you can actually logic out on first principles, you know, it's, it's kind of unsatisfying. Whereas being able to actually deduce, oh, I know this is an adjective because I've run it through these tests, lets you feel like you're sort of figuring something out about the world. It's the appeal of sort of like doing a, a logic puzzle as opposed to being told, like, here's what the Sudoku looks like. If you want to know what the correct answer is to the Sudoku, you just look it up. It's like, well, you could actually just do the Sudoku and then you could figure it out. Uh, and that's more fun than like looking up the answer to the Sudoku. Yeah, I enjoy being a part of speech detective and figuring out what a word is doing in a sentence using the linguistic evidence that I have. Yeah, and similarly, you know, we have existing sorts of diagnostics around verbs. So verbs in English, when they're in the third person singular, often have this other S ending that's not plural. So if I say something like she bigs or she reds or she blues, uh, this is... <laughs> This is very clearly being jocular with language, almost to the point of incoherence, because I'm not quite sure what any of those mean. Um, I guess you could say, like, she bigs herself up, and in that oh, yeah. complex so, yeah, you could do it. structure, it's the big that takes the plural. Yeah, 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 totally. I mean, I don't know if that's an idiom that I have, but when you say it, I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. I'll accept that. Yeah. It's these edge cases. Every time you're like, I figured out what this category is, and then you find these edge cases, and then you find the edge cases to the edge cases, and then someone <laughs> will have written their whole PhD dissertation on an edge case of the edge case. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But that is what makes language so fun to play with. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, I think if I wanted to make, you know, these color terms into verbs, I'd really want to add a suffix at that point. You know, I, I'm going to redden my shirts by washing them in with the reds. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, sometimes we just make make something into a different part of speech by treating as if it is, and then it is that way. And then sometimes we add a suffix or we add, you know, something else to it that, that makes that conversion happen. So maybe it's because redden exists that it's difficult to say, like, I read the shirt by washing it with the reds. Once you realize how effective this kind of adding suffix morphemes to words to create new words and new word categories is. You're like, oh, this is how English has a 100,000 or 200,000 words or whatever people say, because any noun, if you are creative enough English Determined speaker, enough. <laughs> can be adjectivized with like the right amount of creative use of the resources that you already have. Yeah, I just said, you know, the really adjective adjectives, which makes adjective, which is itself a noun, into an adjective, or it can be adjectivized, which then makes it into a verb. And then we can talk about the adjectivization of nouns. Right. Or you can talk about adjectival, which is the adjective of adjective. Yes. <laughs> or the adjectival form of adjective, if you will. I think we're really rapidly approaching the place where adjective doesn't actually feel like it means anything anymore. <laughs> Just in the sense that we've been saying the, the sounds adjective uh, too many times in a row. <laughs> I'm really grateful that we have the diagnostic criteria to know that it does actually mean something in English as a category. And this is where your native speaker intuitions or finding a speaker of a language to consult their intuitions is really important because, as we've already said, there's a difference between forms that we recognize as people regularly using and ones that we are just making up for creativity's sake for this episode. And there are lots of other intuitions that people have about categories like adjectives that they may not have consciously ever reflected on. And I think the order of adjectives is definitely one of those things. Ooh, is this the big red car versus red big car thing? Yes, I think of it as the iced tea phenomenon, personally. I could go for some iced tea right now. Sure. If you would like a flavor of iced tea, what type of iced tea would you like? Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll take a lemon iced tea? I always used to order lemon iced tea in Singapore, and it took like quite a while while I was living there to realize that I was in this weird negotiation with people because I would order a lemon iced tea and they would say, Yes, one iced lemon tea for you. Oh. And lemon iced tea is the phrase that I am used to, and it took a long time for me to actually remember to order an iced lemon tea. And I figured out it was because, for me, iced tea was the genre, so that's the, like, minimal unit, and then I would add mm -hmm. lemon as a second adjective 
to modify that because I could have lemon iced tea or peach iced tea or any other delicious flavor of iced tea. Mango iced tea or something. Whereas for Singaporeans, it was the fact that it was lemon tea or milk tea or black Uh, tea. Yeah, okay. And then you could have hot milk tea or cold milk tea, hot lemon tea or iced lemon tea. Mm -hmm. And so... In this case, the adjective order was dependent on what we thought we were modifying to begin with. That's really neat. There's this kind of meme that circulates the internet every so often pointing out that people say the big red balloon or the four big red balloons or the four big old round red rubber toy balloons. (laughs) Uh, And... You know, this this sounds like maybe a lot of description to go to when I'm talking about balloons, but it sounds kind of unremarkable to you. Whereas if you put it in another order, like the toy rubber red round big four old balloons. I can actually feel you pause and mentally process that. (laughs) (laughs) And the ironic thing is, is I'm reading it out loud, and yet it's still so difficult to say out loud from a page. Um because there are certain conventions about orders that people put adjectives in, and you don't even think about this because you just do it instinctively. And also, it seems to often work fairly similarly across languages, which is Hmm. kind of interesting. So even now that we've just figured out what adjectives are, there are actually subcategories within adjectives. Are they describing like different properties of something? Is that where they come from? Yeah. So for example, people tend to put size before color. So Mm -hmm. that's your big red thing. Or objective or subjective opinion can sometimes go, it can go in a couple different places. So you have like big bad wolf, not bad big wolf. But maybe there's a bad small wolf, just to go back to the lemon iced tea situation. Well, and that's the thing is, there is some sense in which there's a bit of a default order, but there's also a sense in which, you know, the bad big wolf and the good big wolf, you could use that order if you wanted to sort of have a direct contrast there. So in addition to the fact that, hey, the order you put adjectives in is actually more regular and more complicated than you thought about it, there's revelation number one. Mm -hmm. Revelation number two is you can break it still. (laughs) You can do other things with it than this pattern you didn't realize you were following. You can follow the second pattern you also didn't realize you were following. (laughs) It's adjective awareness all the way down. (laughs) Yes. Uh, So one version of this order that people have described is quantity, objective slash subjective opinion, Mm -hmm. size, age, shape, color, quote unquote real adjectives or adjectives not otherwise specified, and purpose. You know, so that's something like rubber for the adjective not otherwise specified, or material maybe, uh, purpose, something like a toy. That That is one order you could come up with. And it, it works fairly well if you're just substituting like red and blue with each other, or old and young with each other in respect to, to these kinds of things. But, you know, you can keep keep stacking adjectives and see <laughs> see which orders break. But of course, sometimes if you put good in there, it's not necessarily going to work the same way as high quality, even though those are both opinions. So you can start creating like a really elaborate taxonomy of adjective orders and you can kind of get somewhere, but you're also like, where am I even going? And obviously intuition is part of this because we found it easier to process one order than the other. But linguists also draw on corpora. So they people will look at how adjectives have been ordered in speech to look at which ones people prefer to go before or after. And it's actually incredibly rare to get seven adjectives. It's really rare for people to describe a balloon in that much detail. (laughs) Well, and it's interesting that we have intuitions about how these seven adjectives can be ordered, even though it's very rare that we actually say seven adjectives in a row like that. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Uh, and in languages, so languages like French, which often puts the adjectives after the noun, you may get the same order, but in the inverse. So like mm. the order is based on like what's closest to the noun, not the linear left to right order or, or first to last order. It can be based on what's sort of closest to the noun and build outwards in the other direction. Although French has this interesting complication, which is that some of its adjectives, big and small, grand, petit, tend to go before the nouns, whereas most of its adjectives go after. So mm. you have this interesting intersection there. So our English diagnostic criteria for adjectives going before a noun is not going to work as neatly for French. Right. You know, one of the things that you learn in French class is like, oh, there are these two classes of adjectives. There's the class that goes before the noun and the class that goes after. Cool. 
Or for some of them, if you put this adjective that conventionally goes before the noun, sometimes it goes after, it means something slightly different when it goes after. Maybe it means something a little bit more literal or something. So the question of like, which part of speech categories are like, the categories that we actually should use and which ones are just like spurious differences that don't really matter because it's not part of the real categories, it turns into this giant can of worms when you start opening it. Because in French, like we could say, oh, well, we have adjectives. Adjectives are adjectives. Surely there are adjectives, right? But mm -hmm. then why not in French have two different categories of like these modifiers that go before the noun versus these modifiers that go after the noun? Why unify them both under adjectives? They don't behave the same way. Do they behave the same way in other ways? They do behave the same way in other contexts. So you can describe them with, you know, comparatives and superlatives, kind of like you can in English. It's not a suffix. It's a, you know, a different word, like kind of like more. Mm -hmm. But one of the key things is that they agree in gender and number with the nouns that they modify. So if you talk about a blue car versus blue cars, you're going to put that extra S silently in the writing, but not necessarily right. in speech, on the word blue as well as the word car. Okay. This is much easier to see in a language like Latin, which actually pronounces these differences, versus French, where it's like kind of fossilized and like mm -hmm. maybe fake, I don't know, depends on who you ask, uh, because it's mostly there in the writing at this point. But in Latin, it's definitely very actively there in the actual speech. It's actually still pronounced. And in Latin, you, any sort of ending change that you do on the nouns, if you make it plural, if you make it possessive, if you make it the subject or the object of the sentence, all of these types of changes that you do to the noun, you have to do with whatever adjectives it goes with. Right. And so the big way that you can tell that something is an adjective is because it's doing all this stuff to match its noun. And so if you, you know, read Latin poetry, you can see, you know, the noun and the adjective can be split apart on different lines and you can tell that they go with each other because they have matching endings. It's really cool that adjectives have a kind of nouny property in French because there's a language in Nepal called Menange where some of the adjectives have like a verby vibe rather than a nouny vibe. I know about this because in a grammatical description by my colleague and collaborator Christine Hildebrand, she talks about they have this really small set of adjectives that behave more like adjectives as we think of them in English. But then they also have this set that are much more, like, they, they come from verbs. You can see how they're related. So kind of an English version of that might be if I say, like, the cat is running, I could also talk about the running cat or the walking cat. Yes. Where run and walk are kind of canonically verbs, but you can also sort of use them in an adjective-y sort of way. Though you don't have to talk about, like, the runningest cat or the walking or cat. You kind of could. You can talk about the more cooked cake. Hmm, okay. Mine turned out underbaked, but yours is more cooked. Yeah, sure. But anyway, and so you absolutely couldn't use the, like, look at if the adjective is doing nouny things criteria that's very important for French. You can't use that for menange. You have to look at how they relate to the verbs instead. Well, and it's interesting because... Uh, doing the research for this episode and looking at, at Latin in a bit more detail, it turns out that Latin grammarians actually didn't distinguish in the same sort of way between nouns and adjectives at all. They talked yeah. about this broader category uh, of nomen, or kind of names, of which both nouns and adjectives were like subcategories. You had your substantive nouns and your adjectival nouns. And these are both subcategories of the general the general categories of nouns, and then verbs was its whole other thing. So in some respects, I like to think of them as kind of adjuverbs and adjunouns. You have your adjectives that kind of work like verbs do, and your adjectives that kind of work like nouns do. And this is true of uh, Algonquian languages as well, is you have in these languages like to be read or to be big is a verb. And so instead of saying this house is big, you say essentially like the house bigs or the house reds. And that means it is big or it is red. It's all one word. Cool. That's very... Very verb, as opposed to the manange, which are like kind of verby. Yeah, they conjugate like verbs, like the verbs get different types of endings and so on, and they really act like verbs, whereas the nouns do a, do a different sort of thing, and they have the endings of like verbs do. So it's interesting to see, okay, like the idea that adjectives exist, you can find evidence in English that they're distinct from both verbs and nouns, they can do different types of things, mm -hmm. but depending on the language, Something that means essentially the same thing, like red or big or something, which seems very, very descriptive-y, 
can, in some languages, have formal properties that makes it more like a verb, and in other languages have formal properties that makes it look like a noun, or neither of the above. Um, I went and looked at the book Describing Morphosyntax, which is a book that sort of tries to do a sort of here's is all the possibilities. Yeah, it's a book that tries to catalog the possibilities for what languages can do, which of course is biased towards which languages have been previously described, but it does sort of give you a, a bit of a, a picture uh, of what some languages do at least. And they actually break down five different types of ways you could treat adjectives. Okay, so here are five common ways if we look across the world's languages, adjectives tend to exist. Right. They call them property concepts, because it's not clear that all of them are actually adjectives. Okay. And so we've talked about three of them already. One is property concepts could be verbs. Mm -hmm. The second is property concepts could be nouns. Mm -hmm. The fifth is there's a distinct class of adjectives for property concepts. I love that's the fifth. Like, the yeah. thing that we think of as the most obvious is like, oh, and also this thing. <laughs> And the other two are sometimes property concepts are treated as nouns and sometimes they're treated as verbs depending on the demands of discourse. Mm -hmm. The example that this book has is in Dutch, but I'm more familiar with the German case, which works in the same way, I think. And this was one of those like weird facts you have to learn about German adjectives if you learn German adjectives in school. Mm -hmm. And the way that they articulated in this book was not the way that I had learned this. It was just like, here's this class of adjectives and it does several different weird things. But it's very cool when you think about it in this way, which is that when the adjective goes before the noun, so if you have something like a red cat, a red car, which is eine rote Katze, ein rotes Auto, a red balloon, ein roter Ballon. In that case, the adjective red has a different form depending on which noun it goes with. So it acts like a noun because it gets all these noun endings depending on the gender. Mm -hmm. But if you say the cat is red, the car is red, the balloon is red, Das Auto ist rot. You don't put the ending there. You just have the kind of bare form of the adjective. And so in that sense, it's acting more verb-like because it doesn't do the same sort of gender agreement that it does when it's before the noun. And so this was just taught to me as like, here's this thing you have to memorize. But to think about it in terms of a typological perspective of like, maybe adjectives are fake and these words are sometimes acting as nouns and sometimes acting as verbs, depending on other things in the discourse, it's just a really interesting proposal. Like German speakers probably think that they have adjectives, but it, it, it's an interesting sort of formal proposal. I like it as a way to rethink something you take for granted. Yeah, because it is true that sometimes they really seem to be very nouny and they get these sort of endings that the nouns get, and sometimes they don't get these endings. And there's also an extent to which they don't really act like verbs because verbs get endings depending on what. Like, if they were being really verby, you should have, like, you you read, du rotest, which that doesn't exist. Du rotest. That doesn't exist. So, like, they don't act fully like verbs, but they could act as sort of in the same way that you can say, like, this is open, this is closed, this is opened, it is closed. It could be some sort of verbal participle thingy. But like, I don't know. It's an interesting way of pointing out that like even the diagnostics that say like it, it takes on morphosyntactic properties of one type of part of speech, therefore it must belong to the same category as that part of speech. If you have a case where it's sometimes it has the same endings and sometimes it doesn't, then there are two things going on. Hmm. So you've talked about four out of five possibilities for how things we think of as adjectives occur across the world's languages. What is the fifth? The fifth one is also a sort of part-time thing, which is that some property concepts get treated as nouns and other ones get treated as verbs. Right. So kind of the opposite. Right. Okay. So this is our Manange example, where you have that very small set that act as adjectives in a particular way, and that you have a set that act as more verby adjectives. Yeah. So for example, and I don't know if this is true of a particular language, you could say maybe colors and numbers in this language get treated as verbs, but sizes and qualities get treated as nouns or, or vice versa or some sort of, some sort of distinction like that. Mm -hmm. And the example in this book is with Yoruba. And I don't know enough Yoruba to have a, have a concrete example of how that works. It does exist in real languages. So that's good enough evidence for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it kind of takes us to this question, which, you know, is also a question if we look back at the Latin based or Greek based, because Greek, Greek did the same thing with Latin where it lumped nouns and adjectives together for, again, really good language internal reasons mm -hmm. that they have the same sets of endings. Um, you know, of like, is the class of adjectives even valid? Is it, is it even really a thing when you start looking at the different types of evidence for a distinct class of words in this case, uh, across different languages? 
And this brings us back to that question of those diagnostic criteria and the ways of testing if something is an adjective or maybe a noun or a verb that we talked about in more detail for English and a little bit of detail for other languages, which is that you need to figure out the criteria that you're using for diagnosis in each language. You can't just come in with the English criteria and try and apply them to Yoruba or Manange or French because it won't work. Right. And of course, it, it begs the question. So, you know, in English, there's an established grammatical tradition of saying, here are the diagnostic criteria for adjectives. And if you're going to work in English, you, you know, it's useful to know what the rest of the literature says for what adjectives are. But if you're working in a language where there hasn't been this kind of descriptive grammatical tradition, you're coming in and saying, okay, so first thing I need to figure out, are there any diagnoses that could prove that this is a different thing, and what would it mean to be different, and what are the sort of language internal things that could prove that some set of unknown words is different from some other set of unknown words, and I don't know what the words are in each of these categories yet. Yes. I remember doing this for Yolmo, and there's a bit of flexibility about whether an adjective can go before a noun or after a noun. They seem to mostly go before, I think, but I never actually, with the, the data that I had, managed to tease apart if it was like a thing that was completely free or if it was because people were focusing on a particular bit of information and they wanted that at the start or the end. And going back to that thing about corpora, one of the examples that I have in the descriptive grammar of Lom Jung Yilmo that I wrote is in there because I was just so excited to have a spontaneous example of someone saying a sentence that had three adjectives in it. Because <laughs> it's so rare. Like, getting people to say something off the cuff with seven adjectives in it is so rare. Like, impossibly rare. Mm. Even just having three adjectives, I was like, it's so pretty. I just, I, I have no reason to put it in the grammar <laughs> except that, like, there are three adjectives here. And, yeah, I you know, had to start from scratch with this language or, you know, start with the existing literature because why make life hard for yourself and figure out my own criteria for whether the category of adjectives existed at all to write about them in the grammar and, and how to explain them. But the existing literature doesn't look something like the like thousand plus page <laughs> Cambridge grammar of the English language that has everything described in exhaustive detail, plus like the hundreds of other books that have written by it. It's like, oh, there are two books. Okay, that's fine. There are a few things around, yes. And it's these edge cases on edge cases that we've been talking about, which is why something like the Cambridge Grammar of English Language doesn't just have adjectives, describe and modify nouns. <laughs> you know, that's it. The one page Cambridge Grammar of the English Language, <laughs> you know, that's, that's all that's there. There's a thousand pages of like, I don't know, probably 50 or 100 pages about adjectives in, in CGEL. I haven't checked. <laughs> so looking at the variation across languages in how what we think of as adjectives behave and how you have to use language specific criteria for deciding if there are adjectives and what they look like brings us to a bigger philosophical question as to whether adjectives exist in language as a kind of thing at all once we start looking at all the variation across the world's languages. And even more broadly, whether it's legitimate to look at multiple languages and try to apply the same sets of categories. Like, is it legitimate to try to say that, like, languages have nouns and languages have verbs? And even if we can establish maybe nounhood and verbhood, because those are, I don't know, fairly basic, <laughs> you know, does that mean that the more edge casey categories like adjectives or adverbs or prepositions or something like that, which can sometimes be done with other types of grammatical features, do those exist? Is it even legitimate to try to cross apply these categories in languages? And it's, it's an ontological question that doesn't have an easy answer. And this is actually an ongoing question in linguistics, and it doesn't have an easy answer, and people are still grappling with this idea of language internal categories versus language general categories. And there's a large extent to which the categories that we think of as sort of basic primary categories, you know, nouns, verbs, adjectives, are inherited from a particular type of intellectual tradition of looking at languages. I mean, kind of the Greek and Latin one, except not entirely, because they didn't actually necessarily think adjectives 
were what a revelation! <laughs> uh, entirely their own thing, um, but it comes from a particular grammatical descriptive tradition. And perhaps if we'd started with a different language, we might have said, "Ah, well, a really important distinction is let's say you're going to be French, whether it goes before the noun or after the noun. Actually, this is a fundamental distinction, and we need to go looking for this distinction in a whole bunch of other languages because we have this easy diagnostic for it in French. Surely there's some sort of like fundamental ontological distinction between this set. So where do you make your fundamental ontological distinctions, and where do you say?" Oh, actually, you know, these are just two subtypes of adjectives. Or these are two subtypes of verbs. Some of them just tend to be adjuverbs. This ongoing debate about word categories and their existence across languages is so long-standing in linguistics that the two different sides of this argument are affectionately known as lumpers and splitters. Which are great names. <laughs> great names. So whether you lump words together that may have been across what people have more lately decided are separate categories. So those original Latin grammarians lumping what we think of as nouns and adjectives together, great lumpers. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're much more splittery in our approach these days. Yeah, by comparison, we're much splittery. Whereas if we were to say, oh, it turns out that, you know, the kinds of things that can go before a noun and after the noun are something different, we could become even more splittery if we wanted to. And you can find people who will argue for a, a lumpier approach or a splittier approach within the same language, sometimes using the same data <laughs> to say, oh, well, you know, there are some similarities or there are some differences. And it depends on whether you think the similarities are more important or the differences are more important for whether you're going to argue for one or the other. And I love how it sort of destabilizes this, you know, we think of again as this fairly intuitive notion of an adjective to say, well, you know, maybe, maybe adjectives aren't a thing or they're not a thing in all languages or the evidence for them is, is different depending on what language you're looking at. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, masks, and ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. It's now available as a paperback. <laughs> yes, it is. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? You can get access to 42 bonus episodes right now to listen to at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Patrons also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and other rewards, as well as helping keep the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include linguistics communication, language and music, and doing linguistics with kids. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella, and our comms producer is Eleanor Bally. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! <laughs>